Okay, today we're going to be talking about an exemplar related to sleep and fatigue, and that is obstructive sleep apnea. So obstructive sleep apnea is an airway occlusion that occurs when someone is sleeping, and basically their tongue falls back and closes off their throat, which causes intermittent breathing patterns, um, sometimes waking up choking or just not breathing very well overnight. And about 10 to 15 percent of females, 20 to 30 percent of males in the United States have OSA, and you know this this number has really grown over time, and they think that's because of growing awareness and testing for this disorder. So risk factors for sleep apnea include different heart dysrhythmias like atrial fibrillation or even heart dysrhythmias that happen while someone is sleeping. Type 2 diabetes is a huge risk factor for OSA. Um, all patients with diabetes really should be tested for sleep apnea. Other issues that are risk factors for sleep apnea include heart failure, hypertension of the lungs and the heart specifically, which we call pulmonary hypertension, being male, being obese, having a thick neck, um, smoking, alcohol use, being middle-aged, having any, of course, abnormalities with the airway itself that, you know, you're starting out with already a, a, a dysfunctional airway, um, and then menopause in women. All of these risk factors, but especially think about patients who are hypertensive, patients who have diabetes, patients who have heart dys dysarrhythmias. Those are your patients that are going to be, uh, and, and patients who are obese. Those are the patients who are going to be most at risk for sleep apnea. So what happens with sleep apnea is that someone who has a large neck, obesity, um, diabetes, hypertension, when they fall asleep, the tongue actually occludes the airway in the back of their throat so that it stops them from breathing. Um, and it happens because muscles relax while we're sleeping, and this can lead to hypoxemia, meaning low oxygen levels, as well as hypercapnia, which means high CO2 levels in the blood. So you can see here in a typical airway when someone's breathing when they're sleeping on the left, um, the airway is open and then air can freely move in and out of the lungs. But with obstructive sleep apnea, the tongue occludes the airway, the airway collapses, um, and then airflow is blocked to the lungs. And so the patient becomes hypoxic and hypercapnic. Now, in a minute, we're going to talk about the complications of sleep apnea, but really the gist of it is that patients who have chronic obstructive sleep apnea are at risk for some pretty severe health complications. So we want to screen patients for sleep apnea and make sure they get tested if they're showing signs and symptoms. So some signs and symptoms that someone might notice uh, that's having obstructive sleep apnea is that they, they or their partner report that they are a loud snorer, um, that they snort in their sleep. Sometimes their partner may witness the apnea, that they witness them stop breathing in the middle of the night, or that they wake up gasping for air or choking, or even that they just report current uh, frequent wakenings overnight. All of these are signs and symptoms of sleep apnea that should cue us in to doing further investigation. So medical diagnosis of sleep apnea is really based on the patient's report of, of poor sleep, maybe feeling fatigued and tired uh, during the day, even though they're sleeping, you know, a full eight hours at night. And ultimately, the diagnosis is going to be based on the patient's report of history, um, as well as, you know, th their risk factors, if they have diabetes, hypertension, an enlarged neck, ob obesity. Um, and then ultimately, it's a, one of those sleep studies where they go in at night and they get hooked up to a bunch of monitors and someone monitors them overnight and can actually monitor for those um, apneic events overnight. And that's really how it's diagnosed. So once a patient is diagnosed with obstructive sleep apnea, the treatment is this continuous positive pressure airway. Um, it's a machine that goes over the patient's nose that they use at night and it blows continuously positive pressure up into their airway and keeps their airway open. And then of course the second goal is weight management. Um, when patients weigh less, they tend to have less obstruction of their airway. So here's just an example of what of one of those CPAP machines look like. Um, it's a mask that goes over the patient's nose with a few straps. And then um, there's a compressor device that's kept on the bedside table 
that allows for that positive pressure um, to continue to keep the airway open overnight. It's hard for patients to get used to this at first, but they do get used to it over time. Most of them do at least. Here's what the mask looks like as well. You can see that it just covers the patient's nose, but not their, uh, their mouth. Now, in some occasions, there are indications for surgery, but it's really uncommon. Sometimes bariatric surgery is done to improve weight loss for patients, which then has the side effect of improved uh, sleep apnea symptoms. And of course, if there's any airway issues um, where there's excess tissue or any abnormalities, sometimes those can be um, corrected surgically to improve the sleep apnea as well. But really, for the most part, it's the CPAP machine and weight reduction that are the most common treatments. So this seems like a pretty benign issue, right? Um, so people stop breathing for a few seconds, but over time, you know, they're all right. They wake up and they sleep. They might just be a little more tired. So why is this such a big deal? Well, it's such a big deal because it, the science has shown that patients who have obstructive sleep apnea and have these recurring episodes end up having a lot of cardiovascular risk factors and are at high risk for things like heart attacks, strokes, um, sudden death, um, and, and, and heart failure. So um, while it's a sleep-related issue, it's really a cardiac and perfusion issue. And so we wanna make sure patients are treated um, quickly and effectively uh, for sleep apnea because they're at risk for these things. My dad, as you know, had a massive heart attack um, a while back and had to end up with five bypasses. And a week before he had gone and had this big heart attack, he actually had a sleep study that showed he had sleep apnea and was having a CPAP machine ordered to the house, you know, while he was working on that and ended up with a huge heart attack. So really these, these complications are very profound and very dangerous. So. Um, we want to have patients have good control over their sleep apnea. So most of the time we're not in a position where we're watching our patients sleeping unless we're working as a sleep study nurse. But if you are working inpatient and you're in a patient's room and they're sleeping, and you may notice some um, apneic episodes or you may notice if they're on an oxygen machine, oxygen monitor, that their O2 sat drops while they're sleeping. Those would be some signs and symptoms you might notice if we're talking about the assessment process of the nursing process. Now, in terms of diagnosis for the nursing process, what are the problems that we can think about? So problems for nurses uh, related to sleep apnea are going to include the patient having sleep deprivation, certainly the risk for decreased cardiac tissue perfusion, remember those cardiac risk factors, and then ineffective sleeping patterns that make the patients really drowsy during the daytime. And as always, we talk about interventions. We talk about assessments to make and actions to take and teaching to do. So when you know someone has a obstructive sleep apnea, you're gonna to wanna to watch their vital signs, their height and weight. You're gonna ask about their sleep and rest and activity. And you'll assess for any edema, bleeding, or any respiratory distress. Now in terms of actions to take, as always, we're going to administer medications as ordered, but be reminded that you never are gonna give a medication to a patient unless you know why you're giving it and what the effect that you're looking for it to have. Now patients for OSA aren't on medication specifically for sleep apnea, but many patients with sleep apnea have diabetes, hypertension, cardiac dysrhythmias, and so they are gonna have orders for medications for those things. And then, of course, we're going to um, facilitate diagnostic testing, like those sleep studies, as ordered. And ter in terms of teaching for the patients, we're going to want to teach them about the disease process, why it happens, what the risk factors are. Uh, using a sleep apnea machine, a CPAP machine, isn't always the most comfortable for a patient. So it's important that the patient understand the risks and why using that machine is so important for them. We want to make sure that they understand how to use the machine, um, and counsel them on weight reduction, which is going to have a positive effect on their sleep apnea. And finally, evaluations. How are we going to know that our sleep apnea patient is doing better? Well, we should have the patient report improved sleeping patterns. They should report waking up less times at night. They should report less daytime sleepiness and fatigue because they're more, more well rested. They should have improved mental alertness and less irritable. All of those things that we feel when we're well rested and getting the sleep that we need. And that's going to wrap it up for our discussion on sleep apnea. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.